Medical equipment in Sub-Saharan Africa is a massive problem. Medical equipment matters because you can't treat patients without it. You can't diagnose them and figure out what's wrong. Um, you can't monitor them when they're in the hospital. You can't offer them treatment and you can't rehabilitate them without functional medical equipment. So it's essential at every level of the health service to have equipment that's working. Zambia, in a sense, is emblematic of the wider issues with medical equipment in Sub-Saharan Africa. So, um, from studies that we did through a needs assessment with VET, um, and also another study done by the Japanese International Cooperation Agency, we found that on average 40% of the equipment in the hospitals wasn't working. And again, that's equipment that's actually in the hospitals. It doesn't capture what should be there and isn't. Yeah, this is a delivery bed where um, a delivery is conducted. Okay. We have um, a, a suctioning, suctioning machine. Okay. In case the baby delivered as uh, secretions, suction is done from here. Okay. Then this is a resuscitator. Yeah. The, the, um, mostly used to resuscitate babies. Okay. With, with born with a, a low up casco. Okay. Then we have an oxygen cylinder in case there's an emergency patient who need oxygen or even a baby. If a baby needs oxygen, we use the, the same oxygen. Then we also have an incubator. Yeah. This is where we put um, babies who need the service. Though we still have an incubator on the other side. Yes. Okay. Then that's uh, supposed to be a suctioning, um, I mean, supposed to be a, that's a suctioning machine as well. Though not, it's, it's defective. It's defective? Yeah, not working. Okay, how long has it not been working for? For some time now. You yeah. can see we're, supp we're supposed to have two bottles, suctioning bottles, but unfortunately we only have one. It hasn't been working for some time. Um, we can maybe look at the equipment in maybe three areas in terms of diagnostics and then uh, monitoring and intervention. So in terms of diagnosis, I think we uh, we are relying mostly on the laboratory and the radiology departments. Those are the two big departments that we have. And uh, places like casualty, still we need to be supplemented if we could uh, maybe use basic, basic ultrasound just there as we are receiving the patient. We do not have that yet. But for the sake of monitoring, Critically, patients in ICU we are unable to, and uh, our chemistry machines in the lab has been uh, on and off, <coughs> such that you know if you want to do electrolyte we profile, we are, uh, are unable to do that. And critical ICU patients might need immediate interventions, and these electrolytes are things that change from hour to hour. You need to keep monitoring, but if you don't do that, it would mean that. You are just shooting in the air using a shotgun method of treatment, meaning that we may have lost some of the patients because of failure to make those critical decisions at the right time. So one of the main reasons there's such a lack of trained personnel is because there are very few training programs in Africa to train biomedical engineering professionals. It's a huge gap. FET uh, launched a medical equipment program to try and address some of the issues around the shortage of biomedical engineers uh, in Zambia and other African countries in 2012 under the Health Partnership Scheme. And so in Zambia, the partnership between uh, Guy's and St Thomas's in London and the Ndola Hospital in uh, Zambia uh, has been able to uh, link biomedical engineers from the UK with their uh, opposite numbers in, uh, in Zambia at uh, Andola Hospital. Um, and the purpose of that is to be able to strengthen the skills and knowledge of the biomedical engineering team in Andola. I come from a background of mechanical. I've done medical equipment in-house training. So you'd find that we, if I may use the word, we are not... 100% there. So we'd, once in a while we need external assistance, like the issue of Peter Cook and uh, uh, Rashid, they've come in, we gave them specifically uh, some equipments that were giving us a lot of problems, a lot of challenges, because we don't have the experience to look after them.
So this hospital, Geyser St Thomas's, have got a link with Indula Hospitals. My involvement today is um, having applied for the grant funding from Thet for a medical equipment project and have been on one support visit to Indula with my colleague Rashid um, where we help do various repairs and um, we're also looking at procuring test equipment for the children's hospital because they've got a workshop set up but no test equipment inside it um, and various other projects going on from here to support them with their equipment problems. So you have to start thinking about being a little bit more innovative in the way that you operate and work. Um, maybe not quite to the same standards as we do in the UK but you know, it's a question of if you don't do anything they've got nothing left so you've got to do something. So you, you try and find maybe a slightly different engineering solution to their problems. Medical equipment technicians should be able to educate the end users on how to use that equipment, how to care for that equipment day to day. So when uh, people like Peter come in and do the training, at times it becomes like uh, a refresher course. But again, uh, like, like I mentioned earlier, Every little training that we acquire goes a long, long way. Our vision for biomedical engineering in Zambia is that it grows as a profession. It becomes more recognized. Um, biomedical engineering professionals here and more widely all over need to be recognized as human resources for health. They're a very critical group of personnel within a hospital and a health system and they need to be recognized for that so that they're given the resources to be able to plan more effectively and contribute more effectively both to maintaining and to managing equipment.